faithfulness amidst falsehood. I'd also call that uh, if personally I was maybe uh, recommending another title for the same, I would say being Christ uh, being Christ like in a Christless world, or being godly or living godly in a godless world. Therefore, maybe to begin, I may ask a rhetorical question. Uh, do we know what we mean by the term falsehood? Maybe you can turn to your neighbor and ask them, what is falsehood? Or what is godlessness? I'm a pioneer, I'm a Lisa. What is Christlessness? Okay, uh, when we talk about faithfulness, the thing that we are talking about or what we are referring to is being firm or being steadfast to a given cause, to a given belief or to a given idea. Like you are being firm and you're not, uh, you're not being shaken because you believe what you have known. The, the idea, the cause, or the subject matter, you have believed it without uh, compromise. You have believed it in, with, with, firm, with firmness and steadfastness in a way that hakuna mtu anaweza kuja badilishe mawazo yako because what you believe is what you know. And therefore, when you do that, we can say that you are faithful because you are believing the idea and you are firmly believing it, steadfastly without uh, changing your mind about it. And also, we say that it's a state of corruptness or a state of error, a state of faith, uh, untruthfulness. When we have such a scenario, we can say that we are in a, in a moment or in a season or within falsehood itself. And therefore, when we look around within the world that we are living in, we can clearly point out and say that this world that we are living in is full of corruptness, it's full of falsehood. And that's why uh, Peter, in his time, he decided to address the issue of us remaining faithful amidst falsehood. Second Peter, as we all know, we can turn all of us to the book of Second Peter. From chapter 1, we come to realize that this was the book that was written by Apostle Peter. Uh, Peter being uh, the brother of Andrew, a disciple of Jesus, among the very first to be called by Jesus. And we remember that he was called while he was still a fisherman. But Jesus called him out of that and promised, him to, uh, promised to make him a fisher of men and not a fisherman who he was previously. And uh, when we look strongly at the evidence that are provided, we see that uh, Peter is one of the very well-known disciples of Jesus. Uh, when you ask your neighbor to mention the disciples of Jesus, I bet uh, that everyone will mention Peter uh, among the very first in the list because we well know him. Uh, and also, when you go to the book of, uh, uh, don't turn there, but uh, when you go to the book of Mark and you study it carefully, you realize that Peter appears most of the time and scholars suggest that he might have taken part in writing that book because the one who wrote it, John Mark, was not among the disciples of Jesus. Therefore, when he was writing this book, he needed uh, to get this information from someone. And Peter might have been the source of the information that he records in his book. 
And then when we open the book of Acts, the very first chapters we realize that we encounter Peter himself after the departure of Jesus. Peter now coming in as the leader of the team. And after the Pentecost where we see the Holy Spirit coming down, uh, the promised Holy Spirit whom Jesus said that stay in Jerusalem until you receive the power from above. And when this power came uh, on the day of the Pentecost and people were wondering what kind of thing is this, what has happened, Peter stands up and gives a very brief sermon which is well known to us and 3,000 people uh, get saved that day and they are baptized. This is the very Peter whom previously in the Gospels is recorded that uh, he was he had a character that was so unique. He was so outgoing and he would always speak his mind something that was very useful. It was an asset and at the same time a liability. And that's why at one point when he tried to stop Jesus from going to the cross, you remember the famous rebuke that Jesus gave him, that get behind me, Satan. And therefore, there are so many things that we can tell about this man, Peter. And when you look at... Uh, other disciples, perhaps we may not really have the same information as to that which we have concerning him. And in the New Testament, uh, now during this time, it was roughly 60 AD after Jesus had died and had gone to heaven, Christianity had begun and it had uh, spread all over persecution has a, had arose and there was a lot of pressure from the outside that Christians, Christianity, being a Christian was a ticket for persecution. During those ages, during that time, standing for their faith meant death. But we see that they stood and that's why um, at some point when Peter realized that the pressure is really growing, he stands and writes the book of First Peter to his audience, the Jewish Christians in, the, uh, in Asia around that time. And he writes to them addressing the issues that they were facing, the issue of persecution, the issue of pressures within. Uh, they were so much and he needed to encourage them and give them the hope that they had in Christ. He needed to, uh, to reassure them that the hope they have in Christ is not meaningless. And he assures them that Christ himself had promised them that he's coming back for them. Because amidst, amidst persecution, you need assurance that whatever you are standing for is not fake. Whatever you are standing for must count. It's not something that at the end of it you need to you will uh, regret why you believed what you believed. You need to be assured that whatever I'm believing is truly something I can hold on. That's why Jesus in the Gospel, he says that you need to count the cost. That's why Peter stood and wrote to them and assuring them that truly whatever you are awaiting is worth the suffering you're going through is even more worth than the persecution that you're going through. And that's what they needed at that time to be assured that their calling is not uh, something that they need to take for granted. And he assures them that whatever they have believed is something that they should hold on so dearly, no matter what. And even us, at such a time as this, it's good when we know what we have believed and what we expect. That after life, what are we looking forward for? Because we have believed in Jesus. Yes. What next? What am I expecting? I know most of us do business uh, courses. And just uh, maybe to point out uh, some of the things you need to consider before setting up a business. 
is to know what shall that business give because uh, you're not a good Samaritan uh, to go and maybe open a business that will yield no returns. In the same way in our faith in Christ, we ought not to believe because others are believing. We ought to believe because we know what will come at the end. And therefore he stresses out that point. Three years later, Peter realizes that in the very church that he was addressing, there are issues that he needs to readdress because now the pressures that were from without, there were others that were from within and those were the most deadly ones that he needed to address at that moment. He realized that false teaching had arose amidst within the church and there are things that he needed to address before things uh, go amiss because history says, history suggests that whenever the devil has attacked the church from without, he has always failed. And perhaps the devil had changed his tactics and he was now attacking the church from within. Falsehood had become so rampant. People were preaching a gospel that is no gospel at all. They were preaching a Christ that doesn't exist. A Christ that never died on the cross. A Christ that was not coming back. A Christ that did not save the world. And therefore he needed to, to rise up and write to these people, reminding them that they have a calling. A calling that they need to make uh, to, to make it uh, assured for them and even for those that are around them. They needed to be deliberate to ensure that they stand firm to the faith that they once received. Reminding them that this faith that they have received, it's not a good story, it's not a good idea. Because during that time, believing in Jesus, by the way, was not a good idea. It was a death sentence, and therefore he needed to let them know that whatever they have believed is so precious to just throw out of the window without considering what it holds or the price that it brings with it. Therefore he encourages them on one part, to remain faithful to the very end. Because Christ will not reward us on terms that maybe we were once Christians. No. That's why Paul says that I have, I have done what? I have run the race, I have fought the fight, and I have kept the faith. In other words, he had endured to the end. Christ himself endured all that to the cross until he said, it is finished. And therefore we likewise, Paul says that we need, just like we've been saved but with Christ, we need to share in his suffering. We need to endure to the end and ensure that we have finished the race. Because the price is not for them who started well, but it's for them who will finish. And that's why when you open the book of uh, a Revelation, you realize that Christ is speaking to the seven churches. And every time he will say that whoever endures to the end, whoever finishes the race, whoever overcomes this to the end, whoever holds his faith to the end, that's why even the scriptures will tell us that hold on so dearly to what you have received so that you don't lose it because the enemy is moving around looking for an opportunity to take it away for minus it eternity is a myth to you and life is something that you'll never taste because only Christ can pay the penalty for our sins therefore he suggests several uh, things that Christians at that time ought to have done, and I believe even to us today, those things still matter. And we can look at them from the book of uh, first, uh, Second Peter, chapter 1. 
it's long, but I'm not going to read all of it. Just going to go through some few verses. From verse 2, the Bible says, Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, as his divine power has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness, through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which have given have been given to us exceedingly great and a precious promise that through the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in this world uh, through lust, but also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith. What? Are we together? In verse 5, it says, Add to your faith virtue, and to virtue, knowledge. To knowledge, add self-control. To self-control, perseverance. And to perseverance, godliness. And to godliness, brotherly kindness. And to brotherly kindness, love. If you recall, Paul also brings out these three aspects. Faith, hope, and love. And he says that the greatest of these three is what? Is love. And therefore, for us to be able to stand amidst falsehood, this and maybe we can go back and think a bit. The gifts of the Holy Spirit are how many? How many are they? Turn to your neighbor and confirm come manager. Sierra from Yes, and the fruits of the the fruit of the Holy Spirit comprises of nine elements too. And among them, turn to your neighbor once. The first one? Love. The second? When I sit here, <laughs> yes, I know you know them. Uh, there is joy, there is peace, there is love, there is patience, there is kindness. And when you look at them so keenly, you realize that Peter is trying to bring them on board again. In other words, he's emphasizing on us yielding to the Holy Spirit and being mature in the faith. Having the Spirit of God that in us we may be able to bear the fruit of the Spirit. Because when we bear the fruit of the Holy Spirit, we can stand amidst such persecution, amidst such falsehood that has uh, been so wide in these times and seasons that you're living in.